You're listening to the Informal Bible Study, a casual and applicational look at the Scriptures. I'm John Stonge, and it's great to have you with us today. Before we take a look at our Scripture today, I'd like to invite you to stop by our website, which is DesireJesus.com. And on our website, you'll find links to our bookstore, links to both of our podcasts, our blog, and a link where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter. Each Tuesday, I send out a newsletter with a word of encouragement and some content to help you in your walk with Christ. And if you'd like to receive that each week in your inbox, it's free. All you need to do is just sign up on the website, desirejesus.com. You'll see the newsletter tab. Just click it, and we'll be happy to add you to the email list. Now let's take a look at today's scripture. A couple weeks ago, we started looking at the book of Joel. And the book of Joel is a very interesting book from the Old Testament. It's not a very long book. Uh, there's certainly plenty of books in the Old Testament that we could look at that are, that are quite long. But the book of Joel is rather short. And, as I've mentioned a few times, it's also one of those books that people totally skip. So I think, if, and we're not going to do this to you today, but if we decided we were going to have a Bible quiz today about areas of the Bible that each of us was most familiar with, I would imagine that we would all do pretty well if we went to the Gospels and maybe even the book of Romans. Hopefully you'd do well in Romans since we've just spent so much time studying the book of Romans, right? If not, I might have to rethink my whole life, all right? Um, Uh, But I I know that if we got into the minor prophets, those small prophetic books at the end of the Old Testament, that most of us would probably struggle because they tend to be the portion of of Scripture that we skip right over because we don't always understand their significance in the big picture. So a couple weeks ago, we started looking at the book of Joel. And if you're just joining us today for the first time, or if you're away during those weeks, those messages are available online, so you can check those out, and you can listen to them and kind of get caught up on the background of things here. But we're looking at Joel with the understanding that it connects to the big picture of what Scripture is revealing, and I'm going to try my best to show us some of those big picture connections that are made Uh, today, just in the the section of Joel that we're looking at, the first verses of chapter 2, the first 11 verses of that chapter. But you could see, even here behind me, you know, when we look at the book of Joel, we could see the righteous judgment of God, we see his encouragement for repentance, and we also see the fact that he restores the things that we have destroyed. So again, we're going to see glimpses of that as we look at our scripture together today. So today we're in Joel chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11. And today we're talking about this idea of tribulation. So in this portion of scripture, we'll see references uh, to a season of tribulation. But I also want to ask this, not just from the general perspective of all humanity, but also from our individual perspective. When you're in the midst of tribulation, what should you do? If you're in the midst of a season that's, that's filled with tribulation, how can we respond? And then looking at the big picture of what the Scripture is talking about in regard to greater tribulation, what should our response be? So if you would turn with me to Joel 2, we're looking at verse 1 down to verse 11, and this is what it says. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness, there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people, like there has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them, peoples are in anguish. All faces grow pale. Like warriors they charge, like soldiers they scale the wall. They march each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. 
They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters His voice before His army, for His camp is exceedingly great. He who executes His word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, and thank you for granting us the privilege to be able to look at it together this morning as we just pause from our normal routine, our normal uh, activities, and we just carve out time that we've dedicated to worship you. So Lord, we're grateful that as part of this time, we have the privilege to sit under the teaching of your word, and we pray that you'd help it to become clear in our minds and clear in our hearts, and that we would understand the big picture of what you're communicating in a portion of Scripture like this, a portion of Scripture that's often skipped, a portion of Scripture that many people, even believers, consider unknown or unfamiliar. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd speak it to our hearts, that you'd help us to grow in our relationship with you as we look at it together. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, have you ever experienced a season that was so disturbing or so troubling or so upsetting that all you wanted to do was scream. I don't know if you're a screamer, if you're a yeller, how you tend to respond. I know some people that when they get very upset, I have a friend um, who has a habit of punching things whenever he gets upset, and he's done damage to doors, and he's done damage to walls, and he's done damage to his hands, and uh, even had to have some surgery on one of his hands after, after getting so upset. So that's probably not the, the best route to take when you're upset. But when you're upset, do you ever just get to a point where you want to yell and you want to scream? Uh, when you're going through a season that feels completely out of your control, do you ever get to a spot where you want to yell? What's the best place to do it if that's what you choose to do? Your car, several of you said that your car, so you know what I'm talking about, which means if you said that, you've done it, right? I have done that. And uh, so you're like, wait, I didn't realize he was going to make that connection, right? Uh, but I know for me, there are multiple times in my life where I've gotten so troubled or so upset, and I thought, all right, if I do this at home, my neighbors might hear me. <laughs> and if I do this at church, somebody might walk in and, and when I think I'm here at the church by myself. But in my car, I know I'm alone, <laughs> and I know that the car next to me probably can't hear me. And uh, I can remember one particular season in my life where I just remember just yelling so loudly in my car. It's, it's almost, you know, surprising that the windows didn't break. I just remember just getting to a spot where I was so frustrated, so exhausted, so emotionally drained, worst trial I could ever remember going through, and at least up to that point. And, uh, and I just remember just yelling out, and uh, asking the Lord for relief, asking the Lord to intervene, asking for Him to do the favor of just giving me a break from the trial that I was going through. When you look at the Scripture that we just read, there are probably some things, if you've never read this portion of Scripture, I imagine that as I read that, you probably thought, that sounds very gloomy. That sounds very dark. That sounds very unsettling. And during the era that Joel was ministering in the midst of, and we don't know a whole ton about Joel, uh, but during this era, as the Lord raised him up to be a prophet, and he's serving the people of Judah, you have the people of Judah going through one of their worst collective trials since they had been established as a kingdom. It's one of the worst. So a few weeks ago, we were talking about one of the things that was taking place at the time was a locust plague. So do you like how clever I got with the slides this week? And you, can you see the faint image of the locust in the background? I just want that image. I mean, you just look at it. It looks like a grasshopper, right? But what happens when you have a billion of them? They come through, and they're devouring the land. They're eating up the vegetation. They've destroyed the once beautiful land of Judah. And so now you have this once prosperous people surrounded by devastation. They're surrounded by destruction. They're surrounded by death. And when you look at the, this portion of Scripture that I just read for us a moment ago, here it also gives prophetic insight. So using the example of the locust plague that they were enduring right then, it's also giving us a prophetic picture of a day that's yet to come, a day of tribulation that's going to be terrible, it's going to be painful, it's going to be miserable, 
much like the people of Judah were experiencing at this particular time. Now, there's that great tribulation period coming. That's on the horizon. We'll talk about that in a moment. But also, let's think about this from a personal response to tribulation kind of mindset as well. When you're in the midst of a season of tribulation, what do you do and what should you do? Because tribulation comes to all of us in one way or another. Trouble comes to us in one way or another. Seasons like that happen. Sometimes they're short. Sometimes they're brief. Sometimes they're a little bit longer. And in response to that, knowing that, that there's a time ahead when the world is going to experience a great collective season of tribulation, is there anything that this Scripture gives to us that's counsel that we could apply now that would be beneficial knowing that that's eventually going to come upon this earth? A couple questions like that I just want floating in our heads as we look at this Scripture together. Now, as we think about this, one of the things that we're given here as a piece of counsel is this idea of sounding an alarm. Did you notice that in the opening verse here when we read this a few moments ago? This idea of sounding alarm. So you're in the midst of tribulation. What should you do? Well, one of the things that Joel encourages the people to do is the Holy Spirit inspires him to profess these things is sound an alarm. Look at what it says in verses 1 and 2. Let me reread these verses. It says, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness, there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Now let me pause there for just a moment. One of the best, most practical, longest lasting gifts I was ever given was an alarm clock that my grandparents gave me as a Christmas gift when I was in seventh grade. And you know what? I still use that alarm clock. I've been using that alarm clock for 31 years. It's always worked. It's never failed. It's been plugged in pretty much continuously for 31 years. And it's loud. You know how when you first get married, there's some adjustments that you have to make. Um, well, one of the adjustments that my poor wife had to make was that alarm. Because I, always, I, I used to be, I'm not now, but I used to be a deep sleeper. And I would put that alarm all the way up, and it was kind of like a train uh, waking us up in the morning. And uh, I since learned that I could adjust the volume and it still wakes me up just fine. But I remember when I was a teenager working at summer camp, and I overslept one morning, and I kept hitting snooze, and I kept hitting snooze. And then finally I realized, hey, I have responsibilities. I have to be up in the dining hall now. I'm, in fact, I'm late, and I, 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 I can't keep, keep hitting snooze, but I had hit it one more time, and then jostled myself awake and went up to the dining hall and ate breakfast. And I'll never forget, so my cabin's in one part of the camp. The dining hall is not too terribly far away, but not right there. You know, it's up. It's the next uh, couple buildings up from where we were. And I come out of the dining hall a little while later, and I'm just walking back there, and I hear this weird sound in the distance. And I thought, that is so odd. What is that? What is, what is that sound, like that blaring? What, and then it dawned on me, that's my alarm. I had hit snooze and then forgot, and now I come out of a building and I can hear my alarm. So that's how loud this thing is. So I went back and I turned it off. Uh, but when you look at this portion of Scripture, this portion of Scripture from Joel, he, he, it's like a loud alarm clock. It's a portion of God's Word that gives us a very helpful warning about what's on the horizon. But many people who have access to this warning completely ignore it. Such was the case in Joel's time, and it's the case in our time as well. And now, admittedly, even when I'm preaching, this is not the type of subject or topic that I think I gravitate towards speaking about. But when we look at this passage, it's very, very clear that the Lord doesn't want us to ignore important cautions like these. Even if they make us shiver, even if they make us uncomfortable, the Lord does not want us to ignore these things. So here you have Joel speaking to the people, and he encourages them to sound an alarm. He tells them to, to blow a trumpet to get the attention of the people because the day of the Lord is coming. That's his counsel. That's his advice. Sound the alarm. Blow a trumpet. The day of the Lord, by the way, that Joel's referencing here 
It's a day that begins with gloom, but it ends with glory. And we see this day referenced elsewhere in Scripture as well. It's not just referenced here in Joel, although multiple times throughout the book of Joel, you see this reference to the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. He keeps speaking about the day of the Lord, but it's referenced elsewhere in Scripture as well. And it's a period of time when this earth is going to undergo a season of tribulation. But once that season's complete, Jesus will return to rule and reign upon this earth as king. Now, I want to show you some of the companion scriptures that speak of this day. There are comments made multiple places elsewhere in Scripture about the day of the Lord or about this season of tribulation that's, that's going to be experienced by the entire earth. Let me show you a few of them. One is in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, where it says this, At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. So you have Daniel prophetically speaking of the same things that Joel is talking about here in this passage. Now let's jump to another portion of Scripture from Mark chapter 13. Here in Mark 13 you have Jesus speaking and he says, But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power, and glory. Now, this is just a sampling of what Scripture refers to in regard to the day of the Lord, and we can see these things referenced elsewhere in Scripture, but the point is, Scripture is making it very clear to us that that day is coming, that this isn't just some sort of abject theory. This is something that Scripture's gone to great lengths to tell us this is a day that the earth will experience. This is a day that's coming. You have the prophets speaking of the day of the Lord. You have Jesus, the Son of God, coming to this earth speaking of this day as well and cautioning us about it. And while we await that day, we're given a privilege. And the privilege is this. You and I are Christ's ambassadors. And what that means is this. Uh, I was listening to a news report this morning that referenced an ambassador, an ambassador from the United States who's an ambassador at large uh, dealing with religious persecution. I didn't know we had an ambassador at large dealing with religious persecution. That might be a newer thing. But what does an ambassador do? An ambassador is someone who represents either a person or a group of people. Well, in the spiritual sense, Scripture tells us we are ambassadors of Christ, and what Christ does through His ambassadors is He makes His appeal to this world through your lips and mine. He's right now making His appeal to this world through our lips, through our life and through our lips. He makes His appeal through what He speaks through us. And that's what he's doing. So right now in the midst of time, while we're waiting for this day of the Lord to come, as the Lord has promised it's going to come, we have the privilege to make this truth known. We have the privilege to make the gospel known. Now, some will ignore the alarm, or some will try to snooze the alarm. But those that Christ is calling unto himself are going to heed that warning, and they will respond while there's still time. But he makes his appeal through us. He sounds the alarm through us. Something else that Scripture brings up in, in Joel chapter 2 that I think is worth noting when we're thinking about this great tribulation but also seasons of tribulation that we endure, and, and, and that's this. We have to deal with what we can't escape. We have to deal with what we can't escape. Um, I, was, I heard a story the other day of a person who confronted a lion. Would you confront a lion? Or would you try and run from the lion? What are your real options when you try and run from a lion? There, you just turn this into a game. It's like, oh, good, I love incorporating games with my meals, right? You might as well fight, you know? But sometimes we want to escape. You know, we think, can I escape this trial? Can I escape this difficulty? Look, we have to deal with what we can't escape. Look at verse 3 down to verse 5. It says, fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. 
Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. So this here could be taken as a reference to the, uh, to the locusts here. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Now let's pause there for a second. Here you have Joel talking about the Garden of Eden, and he's talking about the land looking like the Garden of Eden, and things of that nature. Uh, I always look forward to locally when we hit the month of April, and when you hit the month of April, what starts to happen? Well, things start to bloom, things start to grow, everything starts to green up, and things stay pretty much good right up until we get to about Thanksgiving. And then by the time you get to Thanksgiving, pretty much the last of the leaves drop from the trees. My wife grew up near Buffalo, New York. And there, uh, spring really doesn't get underway until mid-May before you truly start to see things. And, and really, by the time you get to October, you're probably at times dealing with snow already anyway, so they have a very short green season. But I have to say, and this is no secret because I've said this many times, I enjoy this time of year more than I enjoy the cold months. I enjoy this time of year when you can look outside and things are green, when there's leaves on the trees, when things are still growing, when you go outside and the air smells fresh, and, you know, and, and just the foliage is in bloom. Because when you get to the colder months, so for us here, it's really just four kind of tough months, December, January, February, March, but March you start seeing glimpses of hope, but at times I'll just look outside and the sky will look gray and the grass will look brown and the trees have no leaves and I'll look at that and I'll just be like, tree, I'm seeing your potential, but I'm not seeing it realized in this moment. You know, let's bring, let's bring along March. Let's, let's come into bloom. Let's look great. And don't you get that shot of energy when the spring comes, when all of a sudden you just... That's why everybody does some spring cleaning in spring, because you just get that boost of energy. You're tired, or, tired of your cabin fever. You're just ready to burst forth and, and experience what it's like to be outside again. You even enjoy lawn work once or twice, you know, until you realize, no, nah, I guess it still is miserable, Right. But the point is, that's a nice time of year. So imagine living in, the, in, in Judah at this particular time. And Joel, Joel describes Judah as a beautiful place. And he, in his analogy here, he's saying, like the Garden of Eden. So wouldn't that, in your mind, conjure up images of beauty? You know what the Garden of Eden is? Wouldn't you think, oh, what a, what a beautiful thing. Garden of Eden, it's so beautiful, so wonderful. And he's saying the land of Judah just... Res, re, re, um, it's like it reflected the Garden of Eden in its splendor and in its beauty. But then that plague of locusts came through. And as it swarmed through, it ate all the vegetation. It made the region look like a desolate wilderness during a time of year when you would not expect it to look desolate. And here you have Joel describing these locusts like a group of war horses that come through and devour and destroy and consume the beauty of the land. That's the picture that he's developing for us here. For the people of Judah, there was no way to escape this plague. So they would have to deal with the aftermath of this somehow. Because they could not avoid the damaging impact of these insects as they swarmed. There's nothing they could do. Even in our day and age, where we would say we have some more resources or more tools, what would we do? Maybe we would try and spray them. Maybe we would try and... Just throw up some giant net? What would you do? I don't even know what you would do. Maybe we'd try and laser them. Could you laser these things? I mean, we'd be thinking about all sorts of things, right? What would you do to get rid of them? There's really nothing that you could effectively do to get a, a swarm of insects like this, a swarm of locusts, that you could take care of that. There's not much you can do about it other than deal with it. And here you have Joel just speaking about this and saying, look, you know, the aftermath of this ultimately is going to have to be dealt with because they could not avoid the damaging effects of what was taking place. Well, the same is true for those who persist in their rejection of Jesus Christ. When Scripture speaks about tribulation, it's giving a glimpse of bad tribulation through this locust plague, but it's pointing to a greater season of tribulation that's going to come upon this earth. And the earth is going to experience the wrath of God, it's going to experience great tribulation, and the Lord's going to bring that upon this earth as a judgment, as a punishment. 
And it's going to be reserved for those who have chosen to, to persist in their rejection of Christ. For those who have chosen to persist in their unbelief, in their rebellious sin, thumbing their nose against their Creator. Well, in life, you have to deal with what you can't escape. Right? And there are certain things you cannot escape and I cannot escape. You've got to deal with what you cannot escape. And so as much as we would like it to be the case, there are trials that come to your life and come to my life um, that we just can't run from. We may want to be able to run from these things, but we can't run from everything. We have to deal with these things because we can't avoid everything that we would like to avoid. But in regard to the future time of tribulation that's being uh, foreshadowed here in Joel's book, this time of tribulation that will come upon the earth, we have one who has dealt with it for us. And in him, we can escape. We have one who's dealt with it for us. Look at what we're told in Luke chapter 21. In Luke 21, verse 34 to 36, it says, But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. What's Scripture reminding us of as Jesus is speaking about this very day that Joel's talking about here? Well, he's reminding us that even though tribulation is going to come upon this earth, and even though you and I deal with things like uh, you know, being weighed down by the cares of this life. I mean, do you ever just go through a season where you just feel so weighed down with the cares of life? I'll, I'll admit to you, and I've admitted this before, I can be totally fine all day long, but then, but I think that's because I'm active. You know, I'm keeping my mind active, I'm keeping my body active, I'm doing things. I'm not just sitting there lethargic. I'm doing things. But sometimes when I put my head on my pillow at night, and I just try and quiet down. Sometimes I'll just analyze myself and just think, why do I feel worked up with the cares of this life now? None of this stuff was bothering me all day long. And now I try and rest. And now I can't shake it. Now it's going to keep me up for an extra hour because all I want to do is think about it and replay it and do this and do that. And Christ knows that that's the human heart, that that's the type of things that we wrestle with. And your seasons might be a little different than mine, but I'm sure you've felt from time to time weighed down with the cares of this world. But just like Christ says, you know, in regard to greater tribulation, we could also apply the truth that he's talking about here to our individual seasons of trial and tribulation and things that weigh us down. And what is he telling us here? We can find refuge in him. He is our refuge. Christ is our refuge. Christ is our escape you got to deal with what you can't escape. Well, what if you could escape this tribulation that's being spoken of here, ultimately through a relationship with Christ? What if you can rest in the fact that He has good in store for you because you know Him? What if you could rest in the fact that He has already taken your condemnation upon Himself so that you do not need to be destined for wrath because He's now destined you for glory in His presence? What if your heart could find rest in that knowledge and in that truth? Christ is our refuge. Christ is our escape. And those who find life in Him are not destined for wrath. In fact, those who find life in Him will share His glory forever. And that's what Christ is telling us, even in the midst of telling us that there's going to be tribulation that will indeed come. He's also reminding us that in Him we find safety, we find rescue, and we find refuge. And that doesn't just apply to the great tribulation coming upon this earth. That also applies to your sleepless nights. That also applies to whatever the thing is that's nagging your mind right now. That also applies to the things that you try and handle in your own strength or whatever's weighing your heart down or burdening you now. You're going to have to deal with whatever you can't escape. But thankfully, what do we have? A refuge, a respite, a place of escape in Jesus Christ who's took these, he's taken these burdens from us. He carries them upon himself and he says, take my yoke instead because it's light. I love what we're told in verses 6 and 9, 6 through 9 of Joel chapter 2 as he continues to build on these thoughts. But he also shows us here that lacking faith 
So, you know, as I'm saying these things here, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to encourage our hearts to respond with faith to Jesus Christ, our refuge. Because Joel, in his book here, is reminding us that lacking faith will only produce greater anguish. Look at verse 6. He says, Before them, peoples are in anguish. All faces grow pale. Like warriors they charge. Like soldiers they scale the wall. They march each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. Now let me pause there for a moment. So it would probably sound controversial in some circles for me to make this assertion, but I'm going to make this assertion anyway. Uh, we live in an, in an era where it has become essentially perfectly acceptable for somebody to refer to themselves as an atheist. I think 30 years ago that that would have felt a little bit more controversial than it seems now. But I frequently will hear people, even you know, people that are well-known, openly describe themselves without shame or without blush as an atheist. And um, I understand why they would make that, that statement, but here's what I'm going to say that might be considered controversial in some contexts. I don't actually believe that those who consider themselves atheists are as atheistic as they think they are. And what I mean by that is this. I think no matter who you are and no matter what your beliefs are, we are all placing our faith in something. Every single person you have ever met, every single person in this room, every single person in our community is placing their faith in something. We all have faith in something. But if our faith is misplaced, we will experience pain. We will experience sorrow. All sorts of things in that category that we really did not need to endure. Now, when you look at the history of the people of Judah, and when you look at some of the things that the prophets were trying to address with them, and they were trying to be a bit confrontational with them, but the people of Judah had placed their faith in their riches and in their idols. And their allegiance to false gods was being described here, or, well, it's, it's really, it's not necessarily being described, but their allegiance to false gods is being judged here in the midst of this plague that Joel's describing. And as they observe this taking place, they realize they're helpless to do anything about it. They're in the midst of a season they are helpless to do anything about, and Joel describes their faces as growing pale with fear. It's also foreshadowing of what it's going to be like when people go through the season of great tribulation yet to come upon this earth. Their faces grow pale with fear. By the way, that is, and I don't know the biology of why the human body does this, but that's often the human response to trouble, particularly when we're going through this life without an abiding trust in our sovereign creator. Have you ever seen it happen to somebody? Have you ever seen somebody's face go from having its color to growing pale? Do you ever witness that? I had an experience some years ago. I had volunteered to lead a ministry that was in the midst of all sorts of turmoil and all sorts of financial uh, difficulties, and the leadership of the ministry couldn't figure out where the finances were going and why these strange charges were being made in the ministry's name and all that. And so I volunteered to take on this ministry and soon after realized where some of that was going. Someone in ministry leadership was taking those funds. Someone in ministry leadership was spending money on things they shouldn't be spending money on. So I went to this person's house. Awkward moments in life, okay? But I went to this person's home, and I knocked on their door. They opened the door, and we had a conversation, and it was polite, but I also expressed in that moment that I had put the puzzle together, and I figured out where the missing money had gone. And I kid you not, I watched all color drain from that person's face. I watched a, a face with normal coloring go completely white in a very visible way that it was strange to look at, but it also confirmed to me that my assertion was correct. And when you look at what the Scripture says here, it's describing people who are in trouble and they realize we're stuck, we're caught. And what happens when you're in that spot? It's saying, you, it's like you, your face grows pale. It grows pale. The biology of your body realizes what your mind and, and soul 
also know to be the case. And your face grows pale. So let me say this. When we lack faith in Christ, I'm just saying this as a general spiritual principle, when we lack faith, when we lack faith in Christ, what we're doing is we're electing to go through life without His counsel and without His direction. And we're also now faced to, uh, or forced, I guess, to face our trials without a deep awareness of His presence. And that's a, a, a blank face moment. You know, the end result of that approach, going through life without a deep awareness of the presence of Christ, The end result of that approach is anguish. That's what Joel's describing here. But when we walk by faith in Christ, we can face the darkest and the scariest moments of our lives with complete confidence that He's with us. And that He'll even use the darkest moments of our lives to bring future blessing into our lives because that's how the Lord works. He doesn't waste anything. One last piece of counsel that I think this portion of Scripture gives us by way of knowledge and by way of application, and that's this. Whatever situation you're in, let the Lord speak into that situation. Let Him speak into your present-day situation. Let Him speak into your future situations. Look at what Joel says in verses 10 and 11 as we finish our look at this portion of Scripture today. But he says, The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters His voice before His army, for His camp is exceedingly great. He who executes His word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? So here we have Joel telling us that the Lord will utter His voice, and that that which He powerfully speaks forth is going to be powerfully enacted. So in this description, we're being shown, by the way, a glimpse of the future reign of Christ. You have a glimpse here of how this resolves through Jesus. His future reign as king over this earth. He came the first time to serve and suffer. And because Jesus came to this earth the first time to serve and to suffer, I think sometimes we think of Christ primarily only through that lens. But when you look at the totality of what Scripture reveals to us, it teaches us that not only did He come to serve and suffer on our behalf, but He's also promised that He's going to return to rule and reign. And even as this day of the Lord is being spoken of, at least initially with gloomy and dark turns, uh, what ultimately begins to happen is that it's going to result in Christ's glory. I love what we're told in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. There it says this, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Not a beautiful promise of some of the things that Christ has in store for us. He came the first time to serve. He came the first time to suffer. He's coming again to rule. He's coming again to reign. And he invites his people to rule and reign with him. So let me say this before uh, we finish up this morning. I think there are a variety of things that we could take as personal applications from a passage of Scripture like this, even though this is one of those Scriptures that I recognize is probably lesser known. But I think there's a variety of things we could take from this, and one of the things that I personally try and take from a portion of Scripture like this is this. I want to let Him who spoke creation into existence speak into my life, speak into my situation, no matter how bleak the situation may look at different seasons of my life. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I feel down, And you probably feel the same way, but regardless of whether it's an up moment or a down moment or somewhere in between, some of those forgettable moments, regardless, I want to be open to allowing Christ, the one who spoke creation into existence, the one who has promised He's returning to this earth to rule and to reign, to speak into my seasons of trial, to speak into my seasons of tribulation, to speak into my life, whatever the context may be. 
And let me say this by way of admonition, hopefully to encourage your hearts as well. Christ is worthy of your trust. Christ is the one who can turn your tribulation into a divinely orchestrated triumph that brings you blessing and gives Him glory. And He delights to do that for you and for me. So even though the portion of Scripture we just looked at tends to have a lot of gloom in it, don't forget that this portion that we looked at today also resolves here with the one who spoke creation into existence, speaking into the tribulation by his powerful word. And just as he does this on the big scale, he does this as well for us individually. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And thank you for the privilege that it is to be able to look at it together today and to think about these things from the perspective of your plans for human history, but also from the perspective of how you operate in our lives as we go through seasons of tribulation or seasons of trial, recognizing that you are our refuge. You are our sustenance. You are the one who rescues us from all the things that this world tosses our way. So, Lord, we face all sorts of struggles, we face all sorts of difficulties, but we know that we can run to you. And, Lord, we also know that it's wise to welcome your voice in our lives, that it's wise to welcome you to speak into our lives, and that as you speak into our lives, that we have the privilege to be your ambassadors, we have the privilege to be the ones that you speak through, and you make your appeal to others, you sound your alarm to others through us. And so, Lord, we pray that as we welcome you speaking into our lives, that we would also welcome you speaking through us to others, that they would also know that they can escape the coming wrath through faith in you, Lord Jesus. So we're grateful for the privilege to know these things. We're grateful for the privilege to be reminded of them through the examples that were given here in the book of Joel. And we're grateful, Lord, for the fact that we have the privilege to walk with you daily in every context that we find ourselves in. We pray, Lord, that you'd encourage our hearts with that truth today and that we would continue to find our sense of peace and our sense of refuge in you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Informal Bible Study. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, we'd invite you to stop by our website, which is desirejesus.com. And if you're not on our newsletter list, be sure to click the link to sign up right there on the front page of the website. But that's it for us today. Thanks again for listening. We hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week, and we look forward to catching up with you again right here next Monday. Take care.